Hello and welcome back to Green Gold, Copenhagen Green Investment Summit. And I cannot wait to run this session together with you. Uh, with us, we have Ari from uh, Reykjavik University uh, from Iceland joining us uh, online. And then we have Frederick and we have Lasse. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm the phone name. I'm terrible with names, and and uh, and it's been you know this, this. We have five days of program with so many people, good people coming in. So, just uh, I'm human. So, <laughs> so we keep it from there. All right. Uh, today's uh, I would let you each pre uh, do the presentation of who you are and your last name and where you work and all of these things. But I just want to introduce to you the topic is about green um, commercialization. How do, we, how, do we clear, how, how do we make a clear path to increase the number of um, research uh, being uh, seeing the daylight, right? That's basically it, all right? So can we start with uh, you, Lasse? Sure. Please. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name is uh, Lasse Rosendahl. I'm uh, from Olboy University, where I head the Department of Energy Technology. Um, so I'm a, a researcher, um, working with researchers, but also in an environment where we have a, a very strong focus on, on impact. And impact includes also commercialization and, and, and bringing the research out of the lab. So this is something that we actually spend quite a lot of effort on. Um, working within energy uh, technology or the energy sector in general, green uh, technology, green innovation is very much what we uh, focus on. So in, in all of our programs, this is a, is a key element. Um, we, uh, at, at the university, not just in my department, but at, at the university as a whole, we also dedicate a lot of effort on innovation and commercialization. So we have separate units working with uh, not just the researchers, but also uh, external stakeholders, uh, companies, large companies, small companies, upstarts, to try to create uh, the best um, collaborative platform for bringing research into, uh, into uh, implementation and commercialization. So it is something that, uh, that uh, we, we, uh, we take very seriously. Um, and and if, if you allow me to, to brag a little bit, uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of, of in innovations from, from uh, Danish universities come from Olbo University. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Frederick. Uh, my name is not Frederick, but Henrik. Henrik, sorry. <laughs> but that's fine, human. You're just human. <laughs> yeah, I'm only, sorry. <laughs> no, my, my name is Henrik Sondergaard. I work at Lund University, and I work within the food department, uh, food engineering department. But I, my role is, is more of um, engaging with innovation across the faculty. We have a, an institution called Food Faculty, which works across the entire university with, with different faculties, and, and I'm trying to work they're especially related to the food activities and, and our membership within what we call EIT Food Kick. I come from a background where I used to work uh, four years in um, EIT Climate Kick, actually based out of uh, DTU and, and had the responsibility of the Nordic collaboration and the Nordic uh, innovation activities. And in that sense, the whole Kick system, it's an EU driven system which has a focus on, on what's called high TRL, so technology readiness level, with the aim of commercialization. It is, though, also challenging, as, as also was indicated by Lasse, that to finding the right balance between impact and, and commercial uh, opportunities. My background before that, I was also at both Olbo University. Actually, we exchanged a little bit when I used to work with the uh, virtual reality mm -hmm. many years ago. So I actually also worked with uh, within at that time Dong Energy or Ørstel. So I have a background both within the tech, the energy, and now my big concern is the food system. And, and that is to some extent, one of my major interests is about the systemic change, not only the commercial impact, but actually how can we create systemic change within some of the systems related to our sustainability and, and, and climate where we have to make a difference where the standard business models maybe does not work as it used to. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Henrik. You're welcome. <laughs> Ari. 
I know uh, your name. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good morning, and uh, nice to be invited to to uh, join this August panel. Uh, I really wish I could have been there, um, but I am getting my second vaccination today, so it was just just a week too late in getting my vaccinations. Um, glad to be here. My, I'm the president of Reykjavik University. Uh, we are a relatively small university with uh, close to 4,000 students, but our focus is on very close connections with industry and with society, uh, both through the technical subjects and through the social science subjects. Uh, when it comes to sustainability and uh, green, uh, green energy, um, sustainable fisheries and all of these things, we work very closely with the uh, industry in these areas here in Iceland. And that has both impacted the, the studies that we offered. It has a, had a great impact on the research. And it also facilitates uh, the impact of the research and the work that is done at the university in industry and applications thereof. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari. Um, I used to, uh, to, to, to work um, and, and run uh, the Danish Venture Cup organization, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, a shared platform for all the Danish universities when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. And one of the things that I really, really tried hard to, 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 to establish was a better collaboration between universities themselves, among the universities, um, it, and, and connect them, uh, bridge them with, with investors, with young students, and so on. Um, the reason for that is that I read somewhere, and I can't figure out where that was, <laughs> but I read some, somewhere that only 5% of all research is seeing the daylight. So it's becoming materialized to some product and service. Um, do, is, is, are we talking about 95% of all research actually not being used to anything? Is that one of the biggest wastes that we have in our societies? In, when you think about how much we as a society are investing in research? Uh, when you say 5% of, of research seeing daylight, do you mean that becoming something tangible? Yes. Something, an invention or uh, a product, something that can service be... Service or product, yeah. Right. <clears throat> well, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you can definitely say that the opposite is, is not true. Not 100% of what we do doesn't end up. But I, I don't think that you can say that the 95% then is, is a waste because it's, it, I think it's really hard to determine um, exactly. Well, f firstly, when you start out, you have an idea and you want to start doing some research that might take you somewhere. The whole essence of research is that we, we have to figure out, so, so we may have an objective, we may have a target, and we have to figure out how to actually reach that target. And, and, and we don't know exactly how to go about it. If we did, it would be very incremental stuff, you know, so we'd be sort of working at the, typically at the high TRLs, you know, mm. just sort of pushing incremental uh, inventions out. But if we're talking about real research where we, we step back down into the low TRLs, I, I think we have to, uh, you know, we have to uh, uh, accept that, that we, 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 we don't always make it uh, the way that we thought that we would, but we definitely learn something. And that we take back, and so the next time we, we have an idea, hopefully we don't make the same mistakes at least. So, so I, I think you, I mean, knowledge building is a broad thing, and only a narrow part of that ends up in something. But you have to do the knowledge building, otherwise you you'll never get to the high TRLs. But are you satisfied with the 5% of them? <sighs> well, I don't know that it's 5%. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but I, I, it's, I, I, I think um, uh, back from the Skunk Works, they were saying that 10% of what we do ends yeah. up in something useful. Yeah. And I, I think it's so, I think it's, you know, that's probably, uh, you know, that ballpark, yeah. What do you think? Uh, I, I, at, in, in that point, I, I followed the line of Lasse in saying that much of the work done at universities might not end up in, in physical products sold over, directly over the counter, but it might be the capacity building which is necessary over time to build product and services and, and many activities might 
or many ideas might be stemming from, from uh, university work and research, but actually then is being implemented and, and capitalized in another context. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's, it also has something to do with the, um, the motivation of, of the researchers to some extent, yeah. because they are very often, their success criteria or KPI, I recall that it was just mentioned before, is publications. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I would be very surprised if within those 5% also is counted the publications, because that is the core element of research. Mm. And, and in that sense, and even then, you have to remember that only a small or a, a tiny fall, not, I don't know what fraction it is, but it's definitely not all research which gets published. So, so in that sense, there will be obviously a lot of capacity building knowledge created within a university context, which might not immediately see a commercial output. But right. going to the other end, I, I would dare say on the opposite, if you don't build capacity, if you don't build knowledge, especially within the sustainability area, we will never have a chance to create and, and change systems as they are, because then we will go into exactly what, what Lasse was indicating, very high TRL, which very often ends up being optimizations mm. or, or small incremental improvements. But we will not see the radical shift. Exactly. We were just talking about CCS and CCU, mm -hmm. carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and use, mm -hmm. which is something which is tremendously expensive. If you don't work on the basic research, you will never end up having mm. project, yeah. Yeah. products. And research <laughs> takes time. Right, research. So, takes so it's time. not it's not a startup. You get an idea to get to, to build an app, and then you go out and try it out. It, it might take eight years, seven years, and it needs a lot of patience and investment, long-term investment, in different ways. Ari, um, how 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 are you working with with uh, with the commercialization in uh, at Reykjavik? So this is this is and will be, you know, it always has been one of the challenges for universities, and and we should just be honest about that. And I I fully agree with Lasser, and that uh, a lot of research is fundamental. It's it's the the stepping stones that we have to step on on the way to to a goal of changing the world. And uh, Henrik hit the nail on the head that the KPIs are also um, part of what drives things in a certain direction, and. Um, and I think that the way that I see it is that we should look at two parts of this. It's the input and the output. For, sorry, I'm a computer scientist uh, in my background. Um, so one of the things that is important for universities and the research done there is also that the input is not, you know, is information about what problem society needs to solve. I mean, the discussion what we're having here and, and the context of this this conference is that how do we focus on green issues? How do we focus on sustainability matters in the research, whether it's a very low TRLs or very high TRLs? So it's a question of having drivers in the input that lead researchers to interesting questions that down the line can, can lead to, to new inventions. And then it's the on the output side. One of the issues that we have to tackle at universities is that if you ask especially an up and coming researcher, whether they want to spend their time on um, writing the articles that get published or working with uh, a few implementers to create a prototype, their driver is to work on the articles uh, to the publications. And then there is the support in the output also. Uh, there needs to be a seamless way for research then to go out into society. And you can't expect the researcher to put down um, their current objectives and their current grants and, and uh, ambitions uh, to implement things. So I think on the input, we should put in the driver so that the research is being, you know, researchers can choose interesting subjects and then provide support and incentives on the output so that we can, can utilize the higher, the, the research that can lead to inventions and higher TRL applications, the best we can. Thank you so much. Um, there are a couple of things that, uh, you know, I have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> I've been looking forward to this talk and I would, uh, I would love, can I have an extra session somewhere in this? Um, if you're the CEO, you can organize uh, this. Yeah, <laughs> I should decide. Anyway, um, 
the, the, one of the facts is if you look at Berkeley and Stanford and, and, and some of the mechanisms uh, used in Israel to push commercialization, uh, we see the engagement of, of the private sector in, in, uh, in much early phase. I think, if I'm not wrong, at Berkeley there's basically no uh, research without involving uh, private sector in the beginning. So we understand to do research where there's an actual need for, for, uh, for research right, and development. Um, I know that you at uh, Alborg are working uh, a lot with the community and with private sector. You actually also have one of the best results in, in Denmark when it, uh, when it comes to commercialization. Mm -hmm. um, how do you engage with the private sector uh, and investors and entrepreneurs? What is, how do you see that? Well, we, we, we do actually try to do it very, very early on. So we, we try to, um, uh, even, even at idea stage, we try to look around to you. So who, who, who can we see out there who might be interested in, in joining into a, a collaboration, an open uh, entrepreneurship type of thing, where we work with uh, the external stakeholders um, and, and, and see if, if, if they... Uh, you know, if they might. Um, and, and, and so what we, we do is we have internal programs that, that lift the ideas to a, a stage where we feel that they're ready to uh, uh, communicate to, um, to companies or to investors uh, on the idea. Um, and, and then basically try to establish a, a, a collaboration based on, on trust uh, uh, in the early stages to, to say, well, we, you know, we don't know where this is going. We think it, it might be a good idea. Um, if it is, we'll, we'll, mm. we'll have a um, uh, uh, respectful and, and, and open conversation on, on how do we actually com commercialize and, and, and uh, you know, appreciate that, that somebody is taking a risk. And then that risk yeah, has to... There's, a, there's always a, 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 a dialogue, a question about equity and ownership right, of right. IP and those exactly. things when it comes from All universities. Right. Have, you, have you done something differently to attract more interest from, uh, from, uh, from the private sector to engage with you in this, or investors? Well, I don't know if we... I think one of our principles is that we try to do it uh, in, a, in a partnership. So if, if we actually end up with something that can be commercialized, we do it jointly. Right. So, so we, you know, we don't say, well, you know, so this is ours and now you have to pay. Yeah. So we say, well, you know, if it actually comes to a success, we do it together. Do it together. And then we, awesome. uh, you know, so I think that's sort of, and this is what I mean by this sort of, it's, it's a, a risk, uh, at the very beginning, uh, an open relationship based on, on mutual respect. Fantastic. Henrik, um, you represent Lund and we have Alborg from Denmark, and we have uh, Ari from from uh, from uh, Reykjavik. And and is there are you doing it differently at, in in Lund um, regarding the partnerships? I, I I would not say that we necessarily do it differently related to to the partnerships. I I, I would though say that to come back to your initial question, I, I think it's always the classical university question about Pastor's quadrant. Do you are you doing? Mm -hmm. General research, or are you doing more applied research? Yeah. If we are moving into to the more applied research with all the challenges that exist, as we also indicated about the incremental and, and just soothing the current system, um, I think there, there's also the question, as you also raised, around the who has the rights to everything. So we see in Denmark, and we have seen since Helge Sander, the, the famous uh, from research to invoice, kind of logic that we should all be looking towards the applied activities, which were driving certain activities, and especially also the notion that in, in, um, in Denmark, the universities own the IPR yeah. from the researchers. And in that context, we have a different system in Sweden, mm -hmm. because there it's still the inventor's ownership, yeah. which clearly gives some new drives and motivations. I've experienced when working in Denmark, that some of the researchers said, oh, we don't even want to go into the legal departments because it becomes so cumbersome to talk about IPR and they want to create magical solutions financially with something that we have not even developed yet. Yes. So, so they, they try to valorize something that is, is very immature mm -hmm. and, and it actually sometimes stops collaboration. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in Sweden, I see that... Um, 
that some of our also more middle aged as myself, <laughs> researchers, are actually very motivated and driven towards keep continuing to inventing because they can see and, and have the personal benefits of the commercialization. So, so I think it's also very much a political discussion yes. about what system, underlying systems we yeah. have mm. within yeah. the Nordic countries. Yeah. So it's not that simple to no. say no. that. Uh, but, but coming back to, to what you also said, I think it will always be about the relationships and not the least the local ecosystem about how and who can we engage yeah. within our vicinity. And that is also to come back to what you said about Berkeley and, and Palo Alto and, and, and other places or, or Stanford, that, that they have this ecosystem around them. And I think it's about looking into the Nordic ecosystem and, and building on that. That's where we should focus rather on the individual universities' activities, but, but rather what's connected within our Nordic context. Fantastic. Ari, should we, uh, should we include some systemic changes within the universities themselves? Uh, are, we, are we experiencing uh, old-fashioned structures from 1800 that is now uh, the, not living up to the, to the days, uh, today's challenges and the need for fast-speed solutions? Or should we continue the way that we are? And, 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 uh, or is it the third way? What do you think? Um, I, we, we cannot, you know, just stick with what always has been. And uh, one of the things that uh, universities are seeing, and, and most of them are uh, adapting to it, is that we have to be constantly developing. And uh, let me just take as an example um, the development that we've had here for commercialization. Uh, we're actually a very young university, so we're a good example of how things uh, you know, develop over time. We were only founded in 1998. Um, but when we started out with looking at IP and commercialization and, and spin-outs or, or, or other ways of, of creating value from the research, you know, we looked at the models that existed in Denmark, in the US and other places at that time. The ownership of the IP rests with the university. We set up a formula, much like many universities already had, about how the IP gets split between inventors, uh, the university, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it, it was somewhat cumbersome. So one of the things that we've done in, 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 in a, a few years ago is to take out all of these formulas. It's just done on a case by case basis. Uh, in some cases, if the inventor is willing to run with it and do something with it, we're happy. You know, it's uh, the primary objective has become to see something happen with the research and not a question of is there financial benefit for the for the university. And that's just, a, you know, it's a it's a change of frame of mind. Um, but even in that, we have found that, um, you know, we're a small university. We have not been able to set up you know large tech transfer offices that can support all of the issues that arise evaluate connect etc what we've been most successful at is actually integration of research and results into direct collaborators in uh, in industry um, and that's often a hidden um, impact of universities and, and i'm sure all borg and others know this very well it's not always on the surface when you're having serious impact on industry partners but uh one of the good steps that we've taken here in Iceland is to establish a joint TTO technology transfer office for the universities and research institutions. Um, and uh, that's an experiment that we're actually running at the moment. So we always have to be changing. The world changes so fast that the universities have to be adapting to, to the reality at each time. Fantastic, Ari. Um, you, you, you touched the, uh, one of the points that was next on my list and whether it is that we should, um, um, we should create tech transfer uh, offices which were uh, have maybe one, one foot in, uh, in the universities but uh, one foot outside universities and, and maybe in collaboration with, with the partners or should other tech transfers, uh, they need to be closed and stay closed with the universities? Well, I, I, I think uh, 
maybe there isn't uh, one size that fits all. I, I, I see uh, advantages in having the tech transfer close because they and then they under I, a lot of this. It's a it's a lengthy process, and, and yeah. we you know we talked about relationships and. Uh, and I think it's really important that uh, there is also a relationship with the tech transfer, that it's not just somebody external who comes in and says. Yep. So they have to understand. Exactly. Uh, you also have a really good result with it. So yes, we do. Really yes, yes. We don't make any money, but <laughs> no, right. but, but it, yes, it, it, it does work. But what do you measure it with? Is it, is it, is, do you measure it with the impact that you have with, 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 with what's coming up? Is it a long-term investment in, in, in Aalborg University reputation? It, it, Yes, and, it, it, and, and it relationship has been. building with the uh, with yeah. the uh, private sector, it, or is it, it the uh, getting money? You know, as well, as no, we, we haven't got to that part yet. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. Okay. laughs> um, but it's on the agenda. But right. uh, no, but it, it is a it is a long term thing. So we've been building these relationships and also establishing. And I was talking about the procedures and and you know, so how do we actually. Um, uh, approach uh, the companies, uh, and, and, and so this has taken a long time. Uh, and, and, and for that process to be successful, the tech transfer needs to be yeah. close to, to where the, the, the research goes. So on. we should keep it inside, but well, open the doors. Yeah, exactly, open the doors. And yeah. I think this is maybe another side of it. I, I think tech transfer is one side of it. We're bringing, actually, bringing the researchers and, and industry closer together, yeah. and, and, and into that, uh, also adding students. So having them actually work in the same environment, I, I think, is, is something that would really foster a lot of, yeah. uh, um, well, entrepreneurship, really, um, in, 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 in the young people coming through the, uh, the education systems. And we have in, uh, and yes, uh, Boeing was supposed to be here. Uh, he, he had, unfortunately, he, he, he couldn't make it today. But um, there is a program called Open Entrepreneurship in, 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 in Denmark which he initiated uh, together with four universities. I think it's now expanded to almost all the universities, which, which actually is doing what you're saying. So, so it um, takes away the, the responsibility of, of, uh, of the tech transfer from the, the researchers and identify the research, uh, the research that, that has the potential to become a, uh, to make it simple, to become, an, uh, become a, a product or something. And then they, they select people, uh, and entrepreneurs and students and investors around and form a team and make a fast track to see, okay, can we, can we do something with this research? Um, you touch point on, on, on the Nordic environment and so on. If we look into the Nordics, we are among the top rated countries in the world when it comes to sustainability. But when it comes to investing in sustainable technologies, just in Denmark, we are ranked, I think, around number 45 or something. Mm -hmm. So um, you touched on the creating this Nordic uh, you know, um, ecosystem around technologies that, that you as universities are playing a major role in. How is that done in Lund? That, that is a, not a trivial question, so, so I'd rather comment a little bit on some of the other things. I, I really like what uh, the open entrepreneurship, because it, um, and I, maybe that's implicit what I'm going to say. Um, I think with regard to tech transfer yeah. office, it very often becomes a transactional inter or relationship, whereas very much, and what's really needed is, is the trust and the personal relationship. And that sometimes the tech transfer offices builds a barrier, at least especially if we are working in, in the very early stage, which are very transformative. Having that said, I think one of the really excellent things that we have in the Nordics is actually the general trust and understanding of each other. And, and the, I think there was also a question about private-public partnerships. So, 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 so there, there is a seamless interaction about uh, we can go exchange. I ha don't have, despite that last is professor, I'm not f fearing him. When I used to work in Germany, professors <laughs> were somebody like on a pedestal. So, so we have a, a way to engage and, and um, collaborate here in the Nordics, which is unique. Mm. That we are not maybe as good as um, commercializing all solutions in the same way as they might be when it talks about uh, more technical solutions in, in other countries. That might be because we, we're looking more for 
embedded applications rather than straight commercial things. As, for instance, in your energy sector, it's not all, I mean, it's very often or has been traditionally been um, publicly owned. Mm -hmm. so, so how to engage with that, that requires a different skill set as compared to go into, for instance, the US market where it's commercial entities owning power plants, etc. Yeah. So, so it's about building relations and also engaging with the Nordic context. Then as a second point, I think it's also a matter of clock speed. So meaning how fast do you actually turn out inventions and how f especially digital technology just makes the clock speed so fast that it does not, it's not necessarily uh, applicable in the classical university settings where you might need three years to do a PhD because then you are at your next level and then you grow into being an yeah. assistant professor and then over after 10 years you might be pr become professor. If you have a clock speed of saying every six months the industry changes, then it's a totally different rhythm that you have to cater for. Mm. And I'm not certain, and I, in that sense, I like the pragmatism of, of the Icelandic people saying, we have to look at it. The, some industries will be good to handle within the tech transfer yeah. notion. Others yeah. might be more individual, yeah. as indicated. Exactly. And that takes me to the next topic, which is uh, the diversity of research. Uh, we, we, ta we talked about it shortly before we mm -hmm. came in, that, that you know, there, are, there are deep tech that really needs uh, a, uh, uh, life science. Within life science, it takes you know, forever to build something up. Um, and my experience, and, and um, I'm, I never worked at the university, but I worked with the university. Um, and, and please forgive me for that. But it seems like there are so many different departments, and it's extremely difficult to, to know who is doing what. An overview of, you know, I've been asking some of the universities, can, can you provide us with some overview of the research that you have within the sustainability area? Simple question. <laughs> Until today, not a single university has been able to, to deliver that to us. And as a community, we need that. We need, if we want to engage, we, you, need, you need to make it easy for us, easier for us to engage with you as investors, as entrepreneurs, as ecosystem builders. And these are some of the things. And Ari, you are lucky because you are not such a huge university. I was wondering if you have the same challenge with, you know, how are you... Um, how are we working with different departments, working with different topics within sustainability? Because that in itself is, is a challenge. It, it is a big challenge. And if, if, if you ask even a small university like we are, uh, you know, what research is going on? Uh, there's going to be a slight look of panic on our faces because there's just so much diversity. People are doing so many things. Even a single researcher can be touching on different subjects. Um, but we do have two advantages. One of them you already mentioned, which is we're a relatively small university. The other is that um, about 10 years ago, we moved all into the same building. And for any of you who have been in Iceland, the weather here in the winter is such that it's a good thing to be under one roof not have to go outside. But this has really changed how departments work together. And we have then pushed on that by specifically funding and supporting interdisciplinary research groups. And one of the more successful ones is in the area of sustainability, where we have um, close to 35 researchers and research affiliated people working together. And they're from six different departments uh, working in sustainability. And through that, we actually get a, a very good overview of what is going on, what is being worked on. It's everything from machine learning to you know turbulent flow in hydroelectric dams um, and everything in between. So we do have still probably only about 80 or 90%, but we do have a good picture of that. And, and we wanna continue building on that. So. Um, um, both sharing that with other universities, connecting with other universities, working in these areas, but also as a way to really drive interdisciplinary research with the industry. Thank you, Ari. And uh, just to announce uh, a, a small thing, maybe we can work on that because next, um, the next 
uh, a big event that we are we are going to to run. It will be together with Ari at uh, Reykjavik, uh, University, Reykjavik University in September, and we might uh, work on. Our topic is we haven't found a name so far. Uh, we go Icelandish with this one, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's about sustainable technology. So, so I look forward to that, and maybe we can invite all of you to come there. Um, I ha would like to. I have four minutes left, um, so I would actually give that time to you. To if you have some suggestions in how we as uh, not only in Denmark as a country, but as region, as as Nordic region, can become better. You touch based on, on, on you know on the uh, com uh, community. There are some potential in that, but is there any other things that that you think we should do better in terms of innovation? Yeah, and and bringing and, out yeah, bringing out innovation into motion. Well, I think one of the points that Ari had early on that, that we have to uh, we have to develop constantly. I, I think is actually a key in this because this is this is definitely a working point for us that we have. Um, I mean, we have systems that are perhaps not uh, not as uh, flexible and dynamic as, as they could be for us to to handle the, again also the, the different types of. Of, of collaborations that we have and 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 so so uh, maybe that's uh, you know the take home message that we have to really work on this mm. and it has to be again a collaborative effort so from all sides uh, so co collaboration is also the key I think collaboration from, is from absolutely your key. experience absolutely. right because absolutely. you 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 just went through you know a development uh, in in, in uh, commercializing the research yeah, yeah exactly and i think so so key word in that is definitely collaboration all right and all trust right. and trust yes and that's one thing that we that if you're not from denmark or nordic countries then uh, trust means a lot in this region <laughs> yes. we don't have to sign everything we actually then exactly. agree that then right. we're going to do it and then yeah. we do it especially if you're in sweden um, I heard that the Swedes are looking at Danes and they say, you cannot really trust Danes. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we make Swedes trust us more? <laughs> it's obviously a challenge to ask me that question because I'm Danish, <laughs> working in Sweden, yeah. and um, I'm sometimes struggling with the whole consensus about we all have to agree on everything. Yes. And why don't we just... Um, now, what, to come back to you and, and to build on upon what you said, I, I think it's very much about the relationships uh, that we need to, to look into. We need into, to look also into um, within my area where I'm, I'm working within the food industry now, we, we're trying to see how can we, building on both COVID and all other streams mm. of, of sustainability, resilience, etc., can we build a, a local, meaning local, meaning here, a Nordic system where we actually can create a self-sustainability or self-sufficiency uh, on, on food supplies. I mean, the food chain is a very global thing, so, so how can we work on that? And, and in that context, I find it very interesting, and, and we're actually trying to establish, and Ari, I might come back to you at some point, that want to build a, a Nordic food forum to, to cater for both the, make sure that we have the internal transparency, as you just indicated, on what are we actually doing at the different universities at, at the knowledge creation or capacity building basis, but also externally looking out and say, how can we engage with the industry partners and not the least also with the public authorities? Because the public system within, especially in the food system, can be a potential driver of substantial change. And, and here the trust element will be a key element to do that. It will work in some industries, in others it will not be the case. Mm -hmm. But in the food, I believe it's uh, Fantastic. an opportunity. Thank you so much. Ari. Um, <laughs> so if I, if I, if I pick up uh, one of the words that, uh, that you had in your introduction to this last question, which is the Nordic collaboration, uh, which is something that uh, I would very much like to see continue developing and, and strengthening. Um, we have enjoyed and, and benefited greatly from a lot of collaboration, especially with uh, universities in, in Denmark, including Aalborg, but other universities in the Nordics. I think one of the foundations and one of the things that pushes us to increase Nordic collaboration 
is what Henrik mentioned in relation to the food industry, is that it's getting more diverse, it's getting more complex, the supply chains are getting longer. And so we're getting out of this thinking that used to be in the very in many countries is, you know, we have our own food <laughs> production system, whether it's the agriculture or fisheries or what have you, we become experts in that and that's, that's all good. But the world isn't like that anymore. Um, it's much more interconnected. And if I look at the energy sector, um, if you asked any Icelander, you know, 20 years ago, what do you need to know about energy? Basically, it's hydroelectric, it's geothermal and power transmission, then you're good. But the world is changing. I mean, we're looking at new types of renewables like wind power, where Denmark has, uh, has an unbelievable um, advantage in terms of the development and the implementation that others can learn from. And we are starting to develop wind power here in Iceland. So it's all starting to get more connected. And then you get into the batteries, the, you know, the how do you distribute the electricity usage using uh, intelligence and, and uh, data systems, etc. So being able to bring together all of the different expertise of the Nordic countries uh, is going to be essential to really come up with the solutions that we need for sustainable food production, sustainable energy and everything. And um, we have a level of trust, even though it's not perfect between the countries, but forums like this and other events and closer collaboration of universities and industry between countries, I think will be greatly beneficial for all of us if we go down that path. Thank you, and uh, maybe we could make that as a topic in the, in the, uh, in September uh, to, uh, in at your uh, at your uh, conference summit. Uh, we look forward to that, and thank you so much, uh, all of you. Thank you for uh, open and frank, uh, and thank you for letting me challenge you a little bit. Uh, and we take note of your uh, of all of your suggestions, and uh, look forward to continue collaborating with you. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you.